Joan London defines today's working mother like no one else can. For two decades, she, of course, woke us up each day as a host of ABC's Good Morning America, making her the longest running host on early morning network television. She's reported from 27 countries, covered five U.S. presidents, and three royal weddings, including the most recent one of William and Kate. How exciting that must have been. I'll ask you about that later. I'm a big fan of William. Um, <laughs> it should have been me, but you know, I digress. Uh, she's one of the most visible and written about women in America. In sharing her personal experiences, she's become a global parenting and women's health and wellness advocate, dedicating much of her career to educating and inspiring others. In her most hands-on approach to helping women get a jump start to their health and happiness, Six years ago, she created a women's summer getaway, Camp Reveille. I've checked it out online. It looks amazing in Maine. Uh, she leaves every August, as I said, in southern Maine, a place where camp meets spa life, a girl getaway. It's got something for everyone. And yes, she's still signing up campers for this coming summer session, August 18th to the 21st. And I think they've got like like massages and facials that go for several hours each day. So sign up, for goodness sakes. All right, uh, we want to give a very, very, very warm Houston welcome to Joe Munson.
changes everything. Um, on average, we contribute about 40% to our family's annual income. And, you know, what happens is that it's, I don't think it's just about the economic contribution, though, <clears throat> that we make anymore. You know, we work because it becomes part of our definition of self. Uh, we work to obtain status and power and financial independence and to be stimulated and to have an opportunity to maybe make a difference in this world of ours. So, given all the evidence that women are running corporations and media empires and countries, one would think that they would be happier. However, every year in this country, our government conducts these surveys when they do the census, and they ask men and women, how happy are you? And this is pretty much the most reliable data that we have where we can look at happiness levels from decade to decade. And since the early 70s, the level of women's happiness has dropped consistently year after year. So you have to ask why. And by the way, the results are the same regardless of whether the woman, woman is working or has children or how much money she's making, whether she's single, married, or divorced. So today, I think we really are challenged in how to build meaningful careers and maybe make a difference in this world of ours and your community while still being able to raise families and cook dinner. But of course, I'm always reminded Ginger Rogers did everything that Fred Astaire did, only she did it backwards and in three-inch heels. <laughs> That's true. But I really think that the question before women today is, now that we have it all, how do we do it all? How do we do it all without being stressed out and overwhelmed and exhausted? And also, if you look at women today, you know, as a whole, yes, we're better educated. Yes, we have better paying jobs. Most of us are having fewer kids. I know I really screw up that effort. <laughs> and by the way, no matter what you can stand up here and say, I did, whether, you know, 20 years of Good Morning America, you know, training with the Navy SEALs, whatever it is, it's always those seven kids that get me the applause. <laughs> Every time. But if you look a little bit closer at all the statistics for women today, you also will see that we have less free time, more stress, less sex, and more divorce, and more heart disease. We are less fit and healthy than women were 40 years ago. We are trying to be super mom and super wife, pull down a job outside the home while still cooking, cleaning, chauffeuring, and everything else. So it's not surprising that so many women are, you know, stressed out and, and unfit and sometimes overweight and sometimes prone to a lot of different diseases. So it's a deadly combination that I think that we really need to, to address head on in this country. Studies show consistently that women, particularly working mothers, manage their time by reducing their sleep and eliminating their personal time. And I think that in order to stay healthy, we really need to pay attention to our own uh, health and well-being, and we need to take time outs to recharge. Uh, but women, I don't think, pay enough attention to their own health and wellness. And look, I'm the first to say that I've been there and I've been out and I've been running around taking care of everybody else in my life and not myself. Uh, and that's why I think it's important for all of us to share our stories and share our struggles as well as our successes. I remember the day that I started the juggling act of working and being a mom. Um, actually, I was a reporter in New York City. I was 20-something sitting at my typewriter. That's all <laughs> you can Google that to see what it looks like. <laughs> and I got a call, and it was my agent telling me that I had the job at Good Morning America as the host. And about 30 minutes later, I got another call. And it was my gynecologist telling me that I was pregnant with my first child. Wow. In 30 minutes, my life had become this mixture of delight and dilemma. And you know, I wasn't quite sure 
what they were going to do about that because I had my eyes on the morning job for quite a while. I've been filling in for other hosts. And I'm sure that the ABC executives had more than a few discussions about my wonderful baby news. Um, but eventually, I stepped into the role as host of Good Morning America, and then little by little, I would learn about this other new role, that role of working mom. Did you ever hear the joke that the Jewish mother, and she buys her son two ties? So now one night, she's, he's going to go to dinner at her house. He wants to make her happy, so he puts on one of the ties. She opens the door and says, but you didn't like the other time? <laughs> As a working mom, you always feel like that guy. You always feel like you should be wearing the other tie. And we so often find ourselves saying, can we really do it all? Now, of course, to me, that's kind of a working mommy dilemma that so many, so many women deal with today. Um, I remember when I first started Good Morning America, there was so much written about how I was bringing my babies to work with me because I was breastfeeding and I was handling it all. Now, I will remember one particular morning on Good Morning America when I was, uh, I had my little uh, daughter, Jamie, she came to work with me my first day there at eight weeks old. And I was interviewing, I don't remember who it was, but some senator about then President Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economic theory, when all of a sudden I experienced inflation and trickle-down <laughs> in a whole new way. <laughs> now, fortunately, I was wearing a silk blouse, nobody saw it, and, you know, I went and grabbed a blow dryer, and as they say, the show went on. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that women have to deal with all the time, and, and, and now, I'm here to say that I want you to put one more thing into your busy schedule, and that is self-care, and that is fitting your own health into your to-do list, because we're so good at these to-do lists. But we're not so great at putting ourselves on the to-do list. Now, a lot of people always wonder, where the heck does my big interest come from in health? And I will, because a lot of things I do these days, I do a show on Lifetime called uh, Health Corner, I do a show on RLTV called Taking Care, all about family caregiving. I hear a lot of you are dealing with this issue. We're gonna be shooting a new season of programming in the fall on the issue. Uh, in fact, I was just in LA on Tuesday night, we received uh, a Gracie Award for the show Family Caregiving. I'm working on the next Chicken Soup for the Soul book right now, which is also going to be on family caregiving. So if any of you would like to share your stories of taking care of a family member, um, please uh, log on to Chicken Soup for the Soul, and then you'll just go on, there's a, a page that you can uh, click on, and it will explain to you how to uh, submit your story. Or you can just come to my website, johnlondon.com, and share it with me, and I'll uh, take a look at it, see if we can't share it with all with millions of Americans. Uh, but I also work quite closely with different hospitals and large medical organizations, um, very, very much so with the American Heart Association, American Cancer Society. But it really goes back to this passion to disseminate information to help you make better choices about your life and your lifestyle choices that are going to determine your health and your longevity. It goes back to growing up in California. I grew up the, do the daughter of a doctor, um, a oncologist, a cancer surgeon, and he would always take me on the rounds with him at the hospitals, and I just always assumed that I was going to grow up and be a doctor for sure. Um, I was keenly interested in it, but my dad was also a, an avid private pilot and flew all over speaking uh, on cancer and, and also going in to assist other doctors in more difficult surgeries in, in some areas that didn't have the specialists back in those days. And um, we got a new airplane, and he had asked my mom and my brother and me to accompany him down to Southern California, we lived in Northern California, to a big cancer convention. Mom said, no, they shouldn't miss school. But a woman's prerogative to change her mind. She changed her mind and came and picked us up and we were racing back to, to take off and go with him because there were no cell phones in those days. You couldn't call ahead and say, hey, wait up. Uh, and we pulled up the runway just as his plane was lifting off and I waved goodbye not knowing that that would be the last time I would ever wave goodbye to my dad. He crashed on the way back from that 
convention with another cancer specialist. However, my desire to live on in his legacy did not die. And I, when I graduated from high school, I went to work in a hospital that he and a few other doctors had founded and built. And um, I made a discovery in that hospital. I was young, I had skipped a few grades, I was 16, going into college. I made the discovery that my career was not going to be with stitches and scalpels. <laughs> that was not going to happen. And so, interestingly though, I think I ended up choosing a job in a field that really holds hands with the medical profession. Because, you know, for all the brilliant doctors who are out there, you have to get a person to go to the doctor. So the dissemination of information to me is a, is a very important adjunct to the medical profession. And believe me, that is the part of doing Good Morning America all those years that I loved so much. It wasn't just interviewing, you know, whatever star was coming in that was going to be in the movie that was opening that Friday night. It was imparting to the public information that you knew could help save their life or make their pregnancy safer. And so to me, that was the best part of doing Good Morning America. Uh, it, it's also important to me because I made a personal commitment to my health about 20 years ago. I was actually on the air. I was interviewing someone from the American Heart Association. And this representative had brought a little quiz along to um, let our viewers assess their risk for cardiovascular disease. And so here I was, you know, reeling off the question, so are you getting enough sleep? <laughs> so are you making the right eating choices? <laughs> so are you, are you have a fitness program? Like, you know, four or five questions in, I realized I had completely failed this test. And I was the person who sat and interviewed the experts all the time. So I just made a real commitment to myself that day that, you know, in 20, 30 years, I didn't want to be watching from the sidelines. I still wanted to be in the race. And I completely changed my life. Um, I worked with some nutritionists. I learned how to eat properly. I lost 50 pounds. And everybody used to come up to us and constantly say, how did you do it? How did you do it? They all wanted that silver bullet. Until finally my, my daughters, one of which is here with me today, Lindsay, and I remember, I think you said, just write a book already. <laughs> tell them the answer, tell them how you did it so they'll stop asking. And so I did, one of, the, one of my first books. But I think that what we need to have in order to ensure longevity and a long, healthy life is we need to have a game plan. And you need to understand that game plan and take it seriously. Um, so I'm going to share with you today my six strategies to do this. And I'm reminded of George Burns. He once said, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken care of, better care of myself. <laughs> well, we do have that opportunity. You know, I read the other day that um, in an article that baby boomers today are, it is expected that baby boomers are going to spend more years taking care of their parents than they do taking care of their kids. Think about that one. We're all living longer. We, if we don't start having a game plan for this now, for taking up it, I'll have to let a few of you recover from that before I can go on. I'm like, oh God. All right, so strategy number one. Strategy number one is to get a game plan. If you want to ensure a long, vibrant life, you have to start investing in your health today. You can be doing the best job in the world, you know, buying stocks and having savings accounts, but if you're not investing in your health today, you may not be around to enjoy all of that. Now, I read an article once that posed a question that I just think is a great analogy because it just brings it down to the most simple terms. And it was t entitled, Why Do We Treat Our Bodies With the Same Respect That We Treat Our Cars? Now come with me on this one, because it's really true. You're driving down the road. The orange idiot light starts blinking. We all know what that is, right? Service required, service required. What do you do? And you keep that car in so fast, because that was expensive. You want that thing to run as long as it can. All right. So now you have this ache and this pain or this rash or this thing that's not right. The orange idiot light 
that's what it is. And yet what we do is we tend to say, oh no, we'll just wait and see if maybe it won't go away. So why don't we go to the doctor? Maybe it's because we don't want to get any bad news. Maybe it's because we don't want to be told that we have to curtail a bad habit. Maybe it's just because we don't want to take our clothes off and get on the scale. <laughs> come on, come on. But we've all heard it before. Prevention is the key to health. Prevention and screenings and checkups, that is the key to staying ahead of this game. And health really is our choice. It's our choice to make sure that we get all of those needed checkups and that we put in good fuel and that we keep the motor home. But of course, that puts a lot of the responsibility back into our hands. But I say, I want you to look at that as being, being empowering. Because all the research tells us the same thing. Our health and our longevity is only controlled by heredity 30%. That means 70% up to us. So again, the investment that you make in your health today is absolutely going to determine your longevity and the quality of your life. Now, for years, I used every excuse in the book. You'll love a couple of my rationales. I'm exhausted all the time. And I know exercise is exhausting. So how could I possibly be any more exhausted? So therefore, I don't exercise. Or I don't have time. That's one that a lot of us use. But the President of the United States makes time for workouts. And he's got a lot more on his plate. Well, maybe not more. But his things are a little more complicated. But little by little, I did change my life. And I took it seriously. And learning about self-care and self-awareness has an amazing impact on your life. And let me tell you, everyone else in your life will also notice. When I'm feeling fit and feeling in charge of my future, I'm a whole lot more fun to be around. My kids will tell you that. So where do you start to get your game plan? I say you start at strategy number two, which is know your family history. You have to know your family medical history in order to truly understand your health risks. And I remember being out with my mom one day. I was in my 20s, she was in her 50s. And we were at the hair salon. And the owner of the salon came to me and said, your mom's in my office and she's not feeling so great. And she's making light of it. She said, you guys have all kinds of things to do this afternoon that I think she should go to the hospital. Well, fortunately, a few other women who were in the salon heard and insisted that she go. And it was a good thing because she was having a heart attack. However, I will, and she had another one a few years later. But I will tell you that she got the attention she needed. And therefore, I just celebrated with her her 92nd birthday the other day. In fact, a new guy named Joe moved in. <laughs> About four months ago. And she's like up every morning, dolled up at the table. <laughs> Whatever it takes, huh? <laughs> but unfortunately, my mom's reluctance to seek medical attention happens to be incredibly common with us, with women. The American Heart Association did a survey, and they asked all the women in the survey, what would you do if someone in a room was experiencing the symptoms of a heart attack? And they said, Oh, I would drop what I was doing and I would call 911. I would make sure that they got to the hospital. Then they asked those same women, what would you do if you were experiencing the symptoms of a heart attack? Less than 50% said that they would go to the hospital. Less than 50%. Why? Well, I got to pick the kids up from school. I got to go to the grocery store. I got people coming over they wouldn't go and get help. Now, this is a real problem. More women die in this country of heart attacks than men. And it's interesting because most people think of heart disease as a man's disease. More women die of heart attacks, and do you know why? Because we don't go for help. That's the reason why. Men go for help. So when you start to wonder why, 
women aren't going for help. There are a couple of things in play, I think. First of all, the symptoms of a heart attack for a woman are less well-defined. It's not that Hollywood heart attack that, ah, oh, you know, the, the big, you know, chest pain. It can be a pain in the chest, but it can also be a much more subtle pain in the jaw or the neck. It can be all of a sudden a, a feeling of nauseousness. It can be uh, a feeling of being faint. It can be um, all of a sudden getting very sweaty. It's at this part that I usually have about 50 people say, oh my God. <laughs> to understand as women, and I tell it to as many groups as possible, what those symptoms are like and that they're not the same, and that you need to heed those because every second counts. The longer you wait to get help, the more damage that is done to the heart. Um, I think also that the other reason why we don't go for help is because of the way we're wired. We are just nurturers. We're wired to put everybody else in our lives ahead of us first. And I look at I, I, it'd be easier to count the heads that are not doing this. I mean, we all know, we know how we live our lives. And we have to embrace that and understand that and remember that as we listen to our bodies because we have to remember that that's a wonderful quality of ours, but it could also really be a, a, a big detriment to our health when we don't listen to our bodies. So we have to know our risks and we have to take them seriously. So if you don't know your family medical history, I would ask today that you make a promise to yourself that when you go home, you are gonna to talk to your mom and your dad, grandparents if you have them, your aunts and your uncles, and you are going to find out the details. Not just that Uncle Bob had colon cancer, but that he had it at 42. Because that will tell you if you need to have a screening earlier. Um, if you have had a father or, um, a, or a brother that had heart disease before the age of 55, or a mother or a sister who had heart disease before the age of 65, then that means that that is a risk factor of yours. And you need to talk to your family members and find out to the, the answers to these questions. Um, I know that uh, I, I have had a very hard time finding out some of this information because I waited too long, and my mom also has a little bit of the early signs of dementia, and all of her doctors are dead. All of you know she's 92. There's nowhere to go to ask questions. Ask the questions while you can still get the answers. And then I urge everyone to create a PHR. It's a personal health record. It's going to be something that we're going to hear about more and more in this country. And I think if there's one thing that could drastically change the health care system in this country, it is if we all created our own PHRs and that we all took responsibility for our medical information. We have a tendency to go into a doctor's office, they examine you, they write it down in that little file, like, that's your file, hello, and then they put it back, and you walk out, 10 days later, you can't remember what he said. And do you remember your resting heart rate? Do you remember your cholesterol level? We need to get this information and own it, because that is part of having a game plan for health and for longevity. Um, a couple of years ago, my, my brother died of type 2 diabetes, and I was kind of thrust into the position of being in charge of my mom's care. And there were never any records kept. I mean, I went through that house, there were no records of anything. I, I, couldn't, even, I couldn't find anything. I had to like reconstruct her identity and learn how to talk to Social Security and, and Medicare and everything uh, for her. So I also am here to say to you, since I went through this, and I know I went through it the hard way, if someone that you know in your family, and it might be your spouse, it might be your mom and dad, or it might be some other family member that you know that you're going to be responsible for if anything happens to them, do you know where all their medical records are? Do you know who their doctors are? Do you know what prescriptions they take? Is there an advanced health care directive? Is there a power of attorney? If you don't know that information and you aren't in possession of it, 
for your husband or your mom or dad, I urge you to do yourself a big favor today as you walk out of here. Go and get that information and have it. Because when someone really becomes seriously ill or is an accident, that is a very, very tough time to try to get those questions answered. All right, in addition to being keeping good records, it's also important to be in tune with your own body and pay attention to your own wake-up calls. Um, and my wake-up call came when I was 39 years old, and I had three kids, and I never really lost all the weight. You know, it's that last 15 pounds. It's so hard to lose. Well, three times 15 is 45. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you'll multiply it. And I knew I was putting off, you know, a lot of tests because I just didn't really want to know the answers. But I really changed my life, and uh, I honestly think that I can sit up here today and stand up here today and say that I am more fit, I'm healthier, and more vibrant, more engaged in life today at 60 than I was when I made that decision to take charge of my health at 39 years old. And that's really, and I know I added years to my life, so I urge you to make the same game plan for yourself. Question number three, you've heard it a million times, but I can't have this discussion without saying it. You have to find time to fit in fitness. And you have to figure out how to do it in a way that will be enjoyable to you, that will be fun for you, because that's the only way that you'll keep up with it. So I always urge, I say, did you come with a group today that you might be able to put together as your little pack, your little fitness group, maybe a few of your neighbors together, maybe there are other moms that you go to school with every day that your kids are in school together, you make a pack to get out of that car when you're waiting in that carpool line and walk around the field a few times. But however you do it, it, women tend to be more successful if they team up with someone, if for nothing else, just so you can guilt each other. Um, but again, the American Heart Association did a survey and they said 75% of all women today said that they embrace the concept that if we want to live longer, we don't want to fall prey to a disease that we have to exercise. But less than 25% of those women say that they actively engage in any amount of activity that would make any kind of an impact on their health. So um, I will tell you, I'm, I'm no dummy. I married a man who owns summer camps for kids. I mean, he has 18 tennis courts and a climbing wall. <laughs> you know? But about six years ago, he said to me, I'm only, I, wanted, I want to ask you to do something. It's the only thing I'll ever ask you to do at camp. But I want you to start a fitness class here. And I want you to go around and get all the wives of all my key employees and get them in that class. And I want you to just wear them out. <laughs> so that at 9.30 at night, when their husbands are still you know, in a bunk solving a dispute between two 10-year-olds, that they'll be asleep. <laughs> And his idea worked because I put together this group. And if I had just gone and worked out with this trainer that he introduced me to by myself, I might have dropped out. But I put together this group, and I created a community within that community. And we started horseback riding together and climbing mountains together. And now they can't wait to come to camp every summer because it's something that they can't even replicate back home. And that was the seed <coughs> of the idea for my women's summer camp. Because I said, if, they, if this did this much for me and for these women, I need to be able to make this available to other women around the country. And so I started Reveille, uh, Camp Reveille. Reveille is that little da 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 you know, it's like what wakes you up. And I, I look for it to be a wake-up call um, for each woman who comes to camp with us. Uh, this, I'll tell you, this season is August 18th through the 22nd. Uh, we did focus group studies, and they all said, we can only come for four days. We don't have wives. So I only made it a, a long weekend. Um, but it's, you know, and it's different things to different women. Some of them want to take every fitness class that's available and play tennis and climb the climbing wall. And other people want to do ceramics and jewelry making and get the facial. But um, I have skin care line resurgence with Dr. Murat, so they bring in all their estheticians to do facials. Um, but that has really exceeded my wildest expectations because I also find that there is an amazing strength in a community of women. When you get a community of women together, 
They inspire each other, they motivate each other, they share their stories with each other, and the letters that I get back are truly um, trans transformative. So I think that it's important now and then that we um, re have an opportunity to remind each other and ourselves of the strengths and the abilities and the talents that we have to take back to our individual communities and to our families. Um, and by the way, I'm told that we'll, if anybody wants any more information about Revolut, the pro projects I'm working on, we will um, have an email exchange and people can ask questions. Um, so the next, and the other thing I just find that these women always leave with a wonderful new attitude about life. And to me, a huge part of health is attitude. And I say my strategy number four is never underestimate the power of a positive attitude. You know, I'm always asked, always, what was the hardest part of doing 20 years on Good Morning America? You know, everybody thinks I'm going to say, okay, you have to breathe. I really think, I mean, I could say interviewing politicians who were testy and didn't want to answer, <laughs> or rock stars who were stoned and couldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I truly will tell you that to me, my biggest challenge was to make sure that no matter what was going on in my life, that every morning at 7 a.m., I opened that show with a positive attitude with a vibrance, with a vitality, with an energy and an exuberance for the day. Because I knew that that would be the first thing that would affect you even before the news that I had to deliver that day. So I'm always, I've been this like guru of positive thinking forever. My kids call me Bazooka Joan because I've always got my little positive phrases. But when, uh, my daughter Lindsay actually was maybe, I don't know, 11 or so. She came home and she said, you would have loved the speaker we had today at school. They did it. They, he was a motivational, inspirational speaker. And he told us about a study that was done about a positive attitude. So here's how the study goes. I've never forgotten the story. A group of scientists decided they were going to try an experiment to see if they could turn a complete, a complete pessimist into an optimist and then a complete optimist into a pessimist. So they went to a grade school, and they found a little girl who could find only the good in everything. It's going to rain, that's okay, it'll make the flowers grow. <laughs> and then they found a little boy who just saw the good in nothing. A beautiful, sunshiny day would make him say, I'm just going to be hot and sweaty. So they took these two little kids back to their labs, and they put them into two different rooms. They put the little boy into a room with toys and trucks and video games, everything that a little boy could possibly want to play with. And then they took the little girl and they put her into a room with nothing but horse manure. So an hour later, they went back and checked on the little boy. There he was right in the middle of the room, arms folded. They said, what's wrong? He said, well, I knew I wouldn't have time to play with everything, so I didn't play with anything. <laughs> Then they went back in and they tried, they looked for the little girl and she was diving into the horse manure and jumping up out of the horse manure and when she jumped out with this big smile on her face, they said, what's going on? And she said, with all this evidence, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> but truly, truly, a positive attitude, it has such a tremendous impact on other people. If you're walking into a school, into a classroom, if you're a teacher, into a business meeting, you know, into with your family at night, a positive attitude has an amazing impact. But even more importantly, it has an amazing impact on you and your ability to stay happy and vibrant in life. The most important opinion you can have is the opinion you have of yourself. And the most important things you say all day long are the things you say to yourself. So it's terribly important to have a good attitude. They say that people with a good attitude, uh, and even as patients, always have a better immune system, fewer ulcers, better blood pressure, and go through life with you know more laughter and less stress. Now I know that sometimes it can be hard for women to have a positive attitude when it seems like you're the only one in the house that knows how to change a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> However, 
That is what takes me to strategy number five. Listen up, ladies. Learn to ask for help. <laughs> we can't do it all ourselves, not with the current reality of working outside the home and trying to raise children. In my next life, I want to be a man. Men, men really know how to ask for help. They ask for help all the time. We need to become better at that. We think, everybody else, that they're mind readers, but they're not. So I say it's terribly important that as a woman you have to have this conversation with your husband and with your children about what it really takes to run a house and find some equitable distribution of tasks in the house. Because if you just always do it yourself and you never have that discussion, you're always going to be overwhelmed and exhausted and they're always just going to think you are one crabby lunatic. <laughs> Now, part of the reason, too, let's all be honest here, is because you think nobody else can make that bed as good as you, right? Right. Right, everybody raise their right hand. All right, hands up. Repeat after me. It doesn't matter how the bed is made. How the bed is made. As long as it's made. As long as it's made. It doesn't matter how the dishwasher's loaded. How the dishwasher's loaded. babies at once and two bottles and my husband walked in and said I don't know who you are or what you did with my wife but I want her back <laughs> so it's a hard one for a lot of us because we do have this tendency to you know try to do everything ourselves but it is important so my last strategy to you today for maintaining healthy happy vibrant lives is to count your blessings I know our hearts our muscles and they need exercise and they need good fuel but they also need a little TLC. One of my favorite quotes of all times was um, Mark Twain. He said, I've been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that one, it's so true. Boy, do we spend a lot of time worrying about the what ifs. You know, what if this doesn't go right? What if this happens tomorrow? And sometimes we just forget to stop and really focus on the good things in life and appreciate the good stuff. But the simple act of counting your blessings, I highly recommend keeping a journal and journaling this every night because when you write it down, it seems to have more of an impact on you. And it can be a powerful, powerful tool in maintaining a healthy heart and a vibrant mind and, and body. And I don't know what you are planning for your future, but I know that I plan to be playing hard in my fourth quarter. And I want to still be climbing mountains 20 years from now, and I want to feel good, and what the heck, look good, on my way back down. So I am working hard to take care of my heart and my health. And whenever I'm out talking to groups, I always think about my dad, the doctor, and I, don't, I may have strayed far from the scalpel and the stitches, but I don't think I strayed too far from his legacy in trying to help others make good decisions about their health. I wish you all healthy hearts and happy lives. I got married again, 
And again, I married a guy who was 39. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, and then, I guess, finally, 
What was I going to ask you finally here? I'm going to ask you what you, I think we answered so many questions during, oh, uh, what do you have going on next? Everybody wants to know what you're doing next. Uh, so many projects. <laughs> it's, it's great because people will see me and they'll say, are you enjoying retirement? And it's because they don't see me every morning on Good Morning America and yeah. they realize I'm doing 18 other projects. Uh, I started a line of home goods called Joe London Home. We launched on QVC last year. We launched bedding and then we launched, launched uh, uh, throws and pillows. Uh, I have, I'm have. i bringing, once again with my health advocacy, I am bringing a new line of healthy cookware on the market called Twist by Joe London. Uh, we launched September 7th. I leave on Tuesday for China, for Shenzhen, to go over to the factories where we are manufacturing so I can really See it, know everything about it, but it is a new alternative because I know you all want non-stick cookware, but if you have Teflon pans, I can say in a private setting, go home and throw them away because they heat to a certain level and then they start uh, coming apart and you are ingesting that in the food you are eating. We learned 26 years ago that Teflon was bad for us and it's taken this long for people, for the industry to catch up. So I'm really proud to be associated with the company, uh, the cookware company, who is bringing in this new healthy cookware. Uh, and along with that, we're bringing in all kinds of new kitchen appliances. Um, and so it's a whole new career of mine. And we uh, are first on QVC, we gave them an exclusive, and then we're moving into retail uh, probably next spring. So that's one huge project that I work on. Uh, and of course, Reveille, which I hope I have some some Texas women with me this year. We had some women who came last year from the Live Well Conference. So you gotta like come and join the party this year. Uh, I have a skincare line called Resurgence, which I quite love, and that's by Dr. Howard Murad. Uh, and I do programming for different networks. Uh, you may remember Hometown Heroes for Direct TV, Health Corner, uh, Lifetime. I'm just doing this one right now called Taking Care. Uh, I came across my desk and I said, I have to do this. It's on family caregiving. And I'm facing the challenges of taking care of my mom and I see what they are. And then as I learn more about it and realize that there are 45 million Americans uh, struggling with the challenges of caring for someone that they love, uh, I jumped on board to do that project. Wow. So busy. Well, let's give Joan a big round of applause.